Hi, my name is Michelle Benegas. I'm a professor of second language teaching and learning at Hamlin University. This presentation is entitled English Learners in the Mainstream, Academic Language. Our agenda is to take a look at the importance of explicit academic language instruction, the levels of academic language, crafting content-based academic language objectives, or ALOs, and planning for instructional activities that are ALO aligned. The following is a quote from an English learner that will help to illustrate the importance of doing this work. The student says, school is where you go to learn a secret language, but they don't tell you that it's there. You have to figure it out on your own. It's like an initiation to a secret club. Jeff Zwiers defines academic language as the set of words, grammar, and organizational strategies used to describe complex ideas, higher order thinking processes, and abstract concepts. So what makes language sound academic? In everyday language, for example, we use shorter and incomplete sentences, maybe just utterances, like hello and good morning. In academic language, we use longer and more complex sentences, like the sentences that I'm using in this presentation. In everyday language, we use actions through verbs, like to cut down trees or to eat pizza. In academic language, we tend to turn our actions into nouns to build concepts. An example would be deforestation. In everyday language, we use more active voice. How much pizza did they eat, for example? And in academic language, passive voice is more common. How much pizza was eaten? In everyday language, we use shorter noun phrases, like healthy food. And in academic language, we use long noun phrases. For example, improving the nutritional quality of foods offered from other sources. We know that all students are academic language learners. This presentation is crafted with English learners in mind. However, academic language instruction is important for all learners. No one speaks academic language at home over the breakfast table. The following framework is adapted from Dutro and Moran's framework of bricks and mortar. We have branched out into buildings, so we'll be looking at bricks, mortar, and buildings as an analogy to show how academic language is constructed. Bricks. Bricks are the vocabulary specific to content and concepts taught in a discipline. Brick words tend to be found in glossaries and in boldface print in the content area textbooks. You also might find them in a word bank or on a word wall. Bricks are taught at the word level. For our purposes, we're going to think about the word as the smallest unit of language. So when we think about the word and focusing on a word, I want you to think about it in three different ways. The first one is phonology, how words sound. So thinking about the stress used in a certain word or how to pronounce some of those hard consonant sounds that we use. That, those would be examples of phonology. Semantics is what words mean, otherwise known as vocabulary. A lot of teachers are already doing a wonderful job at semantics. And the last one is morphology. Morphology is identifying parts of words, maybe prefixes or suffixes, and then thinking about what those parts of the words mean. <clears throat> the following are some examples of bricks in content areas. In science, some brick words might be volcan volcano, tsunami, or earthquake. In math, addition, subtraction, multiplication. In social studies, amendment, constitution, and in language arts, omniscient and alliteration. So what happens if you only teach bricks? Um, an example of only teaching bricks would be just offering that word bank or just offering that word wall. So our learners know all of these sophisticated content area words. They would do well on a quiz, for example, but they can't operationalize those words in any sort of discussion. Let's move on to mortar. So we started with word, and now I'm gonna ask that you move on to the, the next level, which is a sentence. Mortar words are phrases, uh, mortar, excuse me, mortar words and phrases are the general utility vocabulary used for constructing sentences and paragraphs to engage in discussions using academic English. So mortar words are found across disciplines. They're not specific to a particular discipline. As I said previously, mortar is taught at the sentence level. 
And the sentence level consists of syntax. Syntax is how words fit together otherwise known as grammar, or structure, or form. Some examples of mortar would be, say, connecting words, like, for example, however, although, whereas, phrases with prepositions, like think about, improve on, in addition to, comparatives, like greater than, less than, equal to, as big as. Mortar is hard. Syntax is hard. A lot of us struggle to think about how words are grouped together, and sometimes we're intimidated just by the language used to talk about language, um, the meta language, if you will. So if you don't know the term comparative, for example, you can certainly call those words comparing words or comparing phrases. Notice how I said connecting words. As long as you as the teacher can identify how these groups, how these words belong together in a group, then you can teach them effectively to your students. So what happens if you only teach mortar? Um, I certainly think about myself as an early world language student in high school when I was a Spanish student, um, and I could conjugate verbs, right? I could say something like, I drive, you drives, he drives, she drives, etc. Now, that's great. That gets me to pass the test. But again, it doesn't help me with conversation. No conversation runs that way. So we know that in order to engage in any kind of written or spoken discourse, I need to have the words, the bricks, and I need to have the sentences, the mortar, knowing how that they fit together. Now let's take a look at buildings. When you put the bricks and the mortar together into longer text, you get a building. Buildings are taught at the discourse level, and the discourse level consists of genre, which would be like a type of text. And then pragmatics, so knowing how and when to use different types of text or genre in action. So in linguistics, discourse refers to a unit in language longer than a sentence. I'd like for you to think about discourse um, as spoken text as well as written text. So this could be a debate. Um, this could be a five paragraph essay. This could be um, a student talking through how they solved a math problem using academic language. So there are a variety of buildings that we can put together with different bricks and different mortar. Some examples of buildings would be in science, a lab report. In math, the structure of a math problem, the structure of a math proof, an oral report of how a problem is solved. In social studies, a formal debate, a history report, a news article. In language arts, a letter, a narrative, a screenplay, an autobiography. And there are buildings, there are discourse practices that are used across disciplines. And one of those might be writing definitions. Students utilize language to construct edifices. See how we did that? Take a look at all of the different buildings that are put together. You'll notice that they use different bricks and different mortar to get to their desired outcome. And that's precisely what we're asking our learners to do. So rather than ask them just to write a five paragraph essay or to engage in a debate, we need to give them the pieces in order to move forward and do that. So let's put it all together. You'll take a look at the first column and see that all of the bricks are put in bold. You might think of these as vocabulary. In the second column, you'll see that all of the mortar, or many of the mortar words, are put in bold. And you might think about, which of these mortar words are similar? How could I put them into a group? Lastly, you can take a look at the building. This is the larger piece of text. And here you might identify, what are some norms in this kind of discourse? Moving from content objectives to academic language objectives, or ALOs. The first step in coming up with an academic language objective is naming the content objective. An example from a third grade science class is, I can explain how bats are different from other mammals. An example from a ninth grade social studies class is, I can explain how per capita consumption patterns differ between developed and developing countries. So a content objective may also be known as a learning target. They're known by different things in different schools. And an academic language objective always begins with a content objective. The ALO grows out of the content objective. Step two is deciding which academic language to teach. Now this can be done in one of two ways. The first way is noticing. 
So if I am a practicing teacher in a classroom, I can tailor my language instruction to my students' needs by asking myself, what do I notice about my students' written or oral language that needs attention? What sort of speech patterns am I noticing from my students that I think could be changed to sound more academic? Or what do I see in their writing? I can also use forecasting. I can forecast what language to teach by asking myself, what language do students need to have in order to successfully engage with the content? So I can take a look at the content that's coming and then think about what language do my learners need to have in order to engage in this? This is called a text analysis. Step three, choose a function. The function drives the academic language objective. A function is how language is used to carry out cognitive processes. You may have heard of these in Bloom's taxonomy. This language needs to be explicitly taught. Some examples of language function words are analyze, argue, categorize, compare and contrast, describe, evaluate. I'll let you read the rest. Oftentimes, the same function can be used in a content and academic language objective. Step four, identify your supports. The following are some sample supports provided by WIDA. You might think about sensory supports like manipulatives or pictures and photographs, or graphic supports like charts or tables, or interactive supports like the internet or working with a partner. Step five, decide on the level of academic language. Are you gonna be taking a look at bricks? Are you working at the word level, thinking about phonology? how words sound, semantics, what words mean, or morphology, the pieces of words. Are you going to be working at the sentence level, or syntax, how words fit together? Or are you going to be looking at the discourse level, thinking about genre, so a text structure and its organization, as well as pragmatics, knowing how and when to use different types of text or genre in action? Step six, write an academic language objective, or an ALO. If I'm working at the word level, you can see the sentence frame provided. There's another one at the sentence level and a third at the discourse level. We'll dive into those now. So for word level ALO practice, let's start with I can. I first want to put out that you certainly can start your academic language objective in another way. Some people use students will be able to, and that's entirely up to you. I've used I can across these examples. I can, and then name that function, using whatever I'm going to be focusing on here. Is it vocabulary? Is it a certain phonological topic or morphological topic? And then some examples of that structure. And then that closes with a support. So some examples here are, I can explain how bats are different from other mammals using vocabulary such as herbivore, frugivore, and insectivore with the support of sentence frames. I can explain how bats are different from other mammals using correct stress for words like herbivore, frugivore, and insectivore with the support of an audio recording. I can explain how bats are different from other mammals using the suffix evore for words like herbivore, frugivore, and insectivore with the support of flashcards. Now any one of these ALOs would work for learners. It's up to the teacher to think about what the language needs of the students are. In the first example, I'm really thinking about semantics. What do these words mean? It's, from a, it's a vocabulary perspective. From the second one, this might come from noticing. Maybe if I notice that students are putting the wrong stress um, on a word, I might show them an example of what the word should sound like. Um, and the following one, if I really want to, them to understand how words um, live in families, I might focus on just one part of a word that makes an appearance frequently. So moving on to the sentence level, the structure is similar. We always start with the function. Here we're gonna move into that um, structure or area of syntax and then give some examples of that and close with a support. So an example would be, I can summarize how bats contribute to pollination using ordinal numbers such as first, second, and third with the support of a word wall. Now you might be thinking, I've never heard of ordinal numbers before. If that's the case, you can call them number words or counting words. That's certainly fine. Another example would be, I can compare per capita cons consumption of India and Canada using comparative language such as greater than, less than, as blank as, with the support of sample sentences. 
Finally, discourse level academic language objective practice. Again, we're going to start with the function. The function always drives the academic language objective. And then move into that language genre. So what type of text are we developing? Ending with the support. So an example would be, I can describe how bats disperse seeds in an organized oral presentation with the support of a cycle diagram. Or I can compare per capita consumption patterns with classmates in a group discussion with the support of a bank of sentence starters. Integrating academic language objectives. When you're thinking about lessons, I, I really want to encourage you to think about how you can integrate as many of the four modalities as possible. In language, we take language in in two ways, and those are listening and reading, otherwise known as input. And we put language out in two ways, speaking and writing, otherwise known as output. It's good for all of us, it's good cognitively, for us to be thinking in all of these different ways, to be listening and reading and speaking and writing. When I um, teach my own classes here at the university, sometimes I find myself talking too much and it's not engaging for learners. A good teacher is thinking about how they can get their students to be listening, reading, speaking, and writing all the time. So we know this is just good for cognition, but it's also good for language learning. So we want students to be trying out new words and new structures, um, both by speaking them and writing them and by listening and reading. Finally, sequencing across the curriculum. So when you're taking a look at your curriculum and your planning for academic language, we'd like to encourage that you start by thinking about um, the word level. What do words mean? Um, what um, pieces of words might I need to teach? How do words sound? Then you might move into the sentence level. How do words fit together? And you might close with the discourse level. So what is that big piece of text that my students are going to be working on, either spoken or written text? Now we know that what we plan isn't always what happens, and there's often a lot of reteaching that needs to happen within a lesson. So it certainly isn't always the case that you would go sequentially from word to sentence to discourse. You might start with word, move to sentence, go back to word, move back to sentence, so be, but be thinking from a planning perspective that you want to start small and then go big. This presentation was brought to you by the ELM Project at Hamlin Faculty, myself, Michelle Benegas, as well as Ann Mabbitt and Amy Stoppelstad. Thank you.